It is the American Racing Snobs. I am Tony Rizzuti. I'm joined, as always, by former ESPN, the magazine Formula One correspondent, Eric Morse. Eric, we head to the United States, but before we get ready for the USGP, which we'll make our picks in a little bit, we got to finish up Mexico, Autodromos Hermanos Rodriguez. I thought it was an entertaining Grand Prix from practice to qualifying, the varying weather, and then into the race we saw a lot of hard-nosed wheel-to-wheel action with Lewis Hamilton, his 100th podium. He finally gets that win at Mexico City that he's been looking for for a while, and the, the goat just keeps getting better. I wrote down something in the middle of this race. I think it was like, I don't know, lap 40, lap 45 in my notes. I wrote in big capital letters, I usually feel like I know what's going to happen. And as soon as the pit stops are kind of complete, I have a pretty good picture of where I think everybody should be and what they probably should have done in hindsight to what strategy was going to be best. This race, throw it out the window. I had no idea what was going to be the quickest way to the checkered flag. The high deg, they kept talking about it during FP1, FP2. I didn't get to see FP3, but they kept talking about tires, and Crofty was worried that they were putting everyone to sleep, but he was justifying it with, this is going to be the story of the weekend, and credit to Pirelli for going out on a limb with the tire compounds for this weekend because it sure spiced up the Grand Prix. Uh, There were two drivers looking back at their Grand Prix weekend that I thought really should have won this race. And neither of them were Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton just did what Lewis Hamilton does. He's really a master of all trades right now. I mean, he's already the greatest qualifier in the history of Formula One. This year, he's only got four pole positions. He has just been clever in using tire management, and Mercedes has given him some great strategies to win races. And they've been different. You think about the charge with the extra pit stop that he made at Hungary to win that race that he probably shouldn't have. And then this race... One stopping that early, I thought he was cooked. I I didn't think there was any way. I'm like, hey, you're going to get on the podium, but there's no way you're going to hold everyone off and make these tires last. And he proved me wrong again. It's amazing how he's able to do that. And we should stop doubting him because he's able to do it time after time after time. he did it without Bono. Yeah. Uh, Well, again, I think Mercedes gets the strategy so well that when he got out in front, he could control the pace, and I don't think he overly pushed those tires. He knew it would be close when Vettel finally made his stop. He worried about Leclerc on the the two-stop strategy. We'll get into the strategy here in a little bit, but I think he was able to control the pace enough that when Vettel started to get close, he had enough left that he could push and just keep that gap right out. If he kept him out of DRS zone, that Ferrari was just not going to catch him. And we know, even though the Ferrari tires were 15 laps to the good compared to Hamilton's, that car struggles on tires when they get late in the life. So even though his were a little bit better, they were actually equal because that that Ferrari chassis just abuses the tire. But the right rear that was on that Mercedes of Lewis Hamilton was beyond chewed up. When it parked in Park Ferme at the end of the day, it was like uneven pavement. It, It was crazy what that tire looked like. But Lewis is just the goat. He is just amazing. The the thing that was really impressive to me was Lewis Hamilton went from off the course on the first corner of the race yeah. to victory lane. Now, let's talk about who we thought maybe should have won that race. Once we got settled into a rhythm and the chaos of the start kind of sorted itself out, this looked to me like Charles Leclerc's race. Yeah. Now, any time that a driver is out in front controlling the pace comfortably and then the team makes a call that turns out to be the wrong one, you kind of feel for him. I feel for Charles Leclerc. He ends up, what was it, fourth position off of the podium after controlling the first stage of the race. I feel badly for him. The guy who I think is kicking himself is Max Verstappen. Red Bull needs a clean weekend from him if they are going to win. They didn't have one. And they, they didn't get it at all. He wasn't close. He was the quickest guy in qualifying. And he completely ignored the Marshall's yellow flag. That's an unsafe situation. So did Lewis to a point, but at least Lewis slowed down after it a little bit. Right. Enough to give him the benefit of the doubt that he didn't see it. And by the time he got woed down, right? Yeah. And he got woed down before it started to go yellow. It wasn't yellow when Lewis got to it. Then it went yellow and he immediately slowed down. It was yellow 
for Max, and Max just blew right through it saying he never saw it. Yeah, but they've got to be better than that, whether that's the team warning him that there's – I mean, we had the graphic on our screens well before Max Verstappen got to that area, and I think they'll give him the benefit of the doubt if he lifts. All he's got to do is lift. He's already got the pole position. That was that was not a rookie mistake, but a young person mistake. That's Max being immature. It cost him because pole position turned out to be pretty important. Um, credit to Max for stopping in turn one on the start. Uh, after Lewis was going tooth and nail, trying to hang on to that car in every inch that he could, Lewis just slid over that line of, of control. Max did a good job of avoiding Lewis and keeping his car clean. He had to take a long route through there. And by the time we got that early virtual safety car, I believe Max was still eighth. And I still think he would have been a factor for the win if he didn't come to blows with Valtteri Bottas. Oh, I agree. Are, would you agree that Max and Lewis are probably the the two best wheel-to-wheel racers? Like, they've gotten awfully close. Remember, mm-hmm. I have that photo that's on, been on my computer as my backdrop of Monaco. of Monaco. I mean, they come as close as you can cl- come to hitting, yet they, they rarely do. And if they do, they hit it in the right spot. Obviously, Lewis got a little bit of damage to his floor. We saw after the race. Uh, a lot of damage. Yeah, true. And then we the the move Max put on Botas, and it's a shame it didn't work. And so it's hard to say it was such a great move. But the move he put on in that chicane in the stadium was insane. You just don't try to pass there. And he almost pulled it off. And I know almost only works in what? Hand grenades, nuclear bombs, and a few other Horses. things. But he all, it, that was an incredible move by Max. And it cost him because... It did, it did, but he almost pulled it off. And I know, again, almost... A eh. couple things to react to what you just said. I think one of the reasons that Hamilton and Botas, or not Botas, for stop and race each other so successfully, so closely, is that Lewis says, when it's Max, I know I've got to leave him more room. And Vettel chimed in and said, same here. When I see it's Max, I don't trust him to leave me enough room so I give a little bit more. It's not like they're laying over for him, but they know. It, remember back in IMSA when Montoya was driving for Ganassi, yep. like at the Rolex 24 as a part time driver? The other drivers at Ganassi used to get a light on their dash that would warn them that Montoya was in the car because that's how aggressive he was. I feel like Verstappen is kind of similar to that. You know, he's going to go for it. He's usually going to make the corner, but every once in a while, he doesn't, and it was to his own detriment. That was a really optimistic move on Botas. Now, to pass a Mercedes at Mexico, it's not going to be easy, even if they don't have the best straight line. The real only passing zone in Mexico is down into turn one. If the Red Bull and the Honda can't really hang with the Merck on the straightaways, I understand why he's doing it. I can't knock Max for it because I praised Leclerc for trying something equally as Stupid. Well, not stupid. Optimistic. Right. At Monaco earlier this year. But he can't be surprised that that type of a lunge at that type of a corner is going to end up in a puncture. I think Botas did nothing wrong. Max was trying to be a hero. It ended up costing him. Let's talk about several things from the start of this race. First of all, let's talk about Sebastian Vettel came eerily close to not giving Lewis the proper amount. Remember, there's supposed to be a car length's width between the edge of the racetrack and your car if you're forcing someone over. That was Lewis was smart to get out of it a little bit because Vettel was coming. If that wasn't Hamilton, I think that ends in tears. I think Hamilton, one, has the points to think about, and two, has enough experience to realize this guy either doesn't see me or doesn't care. Yeah. And Lewis was smart enough to back out and save his race, ultimately ending up being a race-winning move. Uh, I was not too impressed with Vettel at the start. I've read some stuff afterwards. It sounds like Vettel says he didn't see him. He He's blaming the state of the mirrors on current well, He didn't current see F1 Lance cars. Stroll. He didn't <laughs> see. Uh, yeah, I think Erickson hit him. No. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not to that level of disbelief. Um I understand there's an awful lot to process in a short amount of time at the start of a Grand Prix. You're, you're releasing the hand clutch. You're checking your shift points. There's all kinds of engine modes. You're looking to the left. You're looking to the right. You're checking your braking point. It is thoroughly possible that Hamilton made his move when Vettel was checking his right mirror, and when he checked his left mirror, he couldn't see him. He was in a blind spot. That's what Vettel says. Do you believe him? I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on it. 
I also am curious. I like the fact that the stewards seem to be letting them race a little bit more. The drivers ask for it. They just want consistency. And it seems like them staying out of that and letting the drivers handle it at least stays consistent with the way it's been since Montreal. I, I, I'm i curious, because it was your guy that kind of had to get off the throttle and, and it really put him in danger to Max getting into that corner. If he doesn't have to lift, he probably isn't dealing with Max down there. So uh, he was what challenging was your view? The Were you okay that the stewards kind of let them play it out? Yeah, I, I was frustrated, but I don't think that that was – it was too ticky-tack to be a penalty, uh, mostly because I think Lewis was smart enough to back out. You know, So it's one of those things where you know, if there had been a crash, I might have felt differently about it. But the fact that Lewis was able to regain the track, compose himself – uh, even though he did miss turn one, I don't think it was intentional. I don't think it merited a penalty there, but I was pretty frustrated. And, uh, you know, after reading about it later, I, I'm i willing to give, like you said, give Sebastian the benefit of the doubt. Lewis didn't seem to ha- have any ill will towards him uh, in post-race. They were they were joking, and they seem to be on much better terms now uh, with each other. And I, I agree. Think, I think a big part of that is that Vettel is driving at a more successful level. And I, I don't think that Lewis really wanted to pile on to Sebastian when the rest of the global media was saying, oh, he's making too many mistakes, this guy's done. Uh, I think they genuinely do get along. They may not be the best of friends, but you know they, they've spent, what is it now, 12 years touring the world together. Uh, they, they came in a year apart. Uh, I think Sebastian's first Grand Prix that he ever raced in was Lewis's second victory at uh, Indianapolis in 2007. And by the end of that year, Sebastian was a full-time driver at Toro Rosso. So they spent a lot of time together, but it's good to see that rapport back. There's a, there's always been a respect. And in the early part of the year where you don't know how the championship's going to play out, when somebody keeps knocking into you or spinning himself out as, as car number five and car 44 seemed to be uh, had that magnetic attraction for the last year and a half, now that this championship is all but done and dusted, I think it's good to see – on a human level, that there's some understanding there and some give and take. Uh, and I think, you know, Lewis Lewis seems to understand that it's possible <laughs> that Seb didn't see him. That I couldn't quite hear what they were talking about um, before the podium there in that room, but uh, the body language suggests there's no problem. It's interesting that you mentioned the rapport, because as a Ferrari fan, I certainly have noticed in the last couple of races for sure, it seems like Vettel gets along way better with Hamilton and Botas than he does his own teammate. He seems very comfortable with those guys kicking Botas about the start at the last race. He was all over Hamilton and Botas this last race at Mexico, like hugging on him, arm around him, joking with him. Well, Leclerc wasn't on the podium, to which, be fair. Which you don't normally see, though. You don't normally see that. He seems to have a really good rapport with those guys, which I think is interesting. I want to talk about... Leclerc and Albon here in a second, but how nice was it to see the early pace that the McLarens had? Carlos Sainz getting aggressive in there, getting up front, and holding his own over the Mercedes for several laps. Look good to see that McLaren up there racing. And once again, it's poor Lando Norris. Yeah, uh, not to rain on their parade, breaks, but yeah. if, if there's going to be bad luck on an orange car. It's going to be Lando Norris. But Sainz was up there just getting it. They've had a strong season, and they didn't come away with any points this weekend, and I, I think there's a number of reasons for that. But yep. their early pace was certainly encouraging. They're really good in qualifying, and they've been making good starts lately. This isn't the first time that we've seen an orange car mixing it up with the big three at the start of a race. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned that in the the pre-race grid walk. It might have been Max. They were talking or Albon talking about what are you going to do with the cars up in front? And he's like, I got the orange cars behind me, and they've been great on start. So it's not just ahead. I got to worry about behind. McLaren so is good still point. when it comes to race pace, they're still a full pit stop behind the top teams. But if they can start cutting into that gap in the in the off season and roll out a car that can get up there. They've proven that they've got single lap pace that's that's nipping at their heels, and like we said, they're making great starts. It's not, uh, you know, I think it was uh, Japan and maybe Russia as well. You saw a McLaren in front of either a Mercedes or a Red Bull, and uh, sometimes it's both of them. So yep. it's not just Carlos Sainz is punching above his his 
weight level right now. Uh, I think that Lando Norris is, for a rookie, having a really impressive season, even if the points don't necessarily show that. He's currently being doubled up by his teammate, a little little more than doubled up, with Sainz scoring 76 points, Lando at 35, but that does not really paint a true picture of Lando's season. He's had all those DNFs, uh, what is it, six? I think that's the second most on the grid behind only uh, Grosjean. So I, bad luck's definitely following him. That terrible pit stop in Mexico City uh, where they stopped the car because they didn't get the tire on and then pushed him backwards the length of the pit lane back there. You don't see that in F1 very much. So it was kind of like a, a NASCAR pit circus move. No, we saw quite a bit of problems on pit road with trying to get wheels on, off, really more on than off. Let's talk about Albon a little bit. Other than his crash in practice, I thought it was the best Grand Prix we've seen out of him, yet there's not a whole lot to say. It was kind of he got out there, got in his spot, and just kind of stayed there. Uh, He was running as high as third. Uh, Where do you bring it home, like fifth? Fifth. Yeah, Uh, only but one a, spot behind his best finish ever at Japan a couple weeks ago. But a clean ago. Grand Prix, uh, again, other than practice, and, and Christian Horner gave him the benefit of the doubt there. He just kind of overstepped the line a little He's bit. still a rookie. He's a true rookie in in one of the most desired seats in F1 right now. I mean, there's only two cars that are, are categorically quicker than the Red Bull right now, and those teams don't put rookies in their seats. So this is all you can ask for as a rookie driver is to – try to slowly get on pace with the the phenom that is Max Verstappen, and he's slowly doing that. Yeah, he had a- I, I'm seeing more progress from Albon than we saw from Gasly over the first, you know, what was that, four-fifths of the season? Uh, anyway, I, I'm impressed with Albon's ability to adapt. I think he's doing what he needs to to earn a second seat there. Now, if he's going to keep that seat, he is absolutely going to have to start getting on the podium on a regular basis, but we'll see what type of car they put underneath him next year. But I think he's earned a 2020 drive with that team. Yeah, I agree. And I th- again, I thought he had a, a, a really a flawless drive, did what he needed to do to stay in that position. But then everything you just said about him, being a rookie, kind of getting his feet wet with that car and getting a lot better, makes me question why in the world, if you're Ferrari and you're leading the race, would you pit to cover Albon? Albon's not winning that race. I'm sorry. But He's not there yet. That was a horrible decision. Now, Matteo Bonotto said, hey, look, we had to cover the undercut. We just had to because at the time that was still a fast car. That was a top three car that had made the undercut, and we had to do that. And, and, and sometimes when you're leading, you have to make decisions that you don't really want to do. But I thought it was ridiculous that they chased Albon. I think they chased him with the wrong car. Now— to Ferrari's defense, this race had two stopper written all over it. I can't believe the winning car was on a one stopper. Coming into this with the tire deg and even the way that the hards were behaving, I thought that every single car was going to be on for a two stopper, and I was excited for that. I can't believe Hamilton pitted as early as he did and made it last. I don't think, in retrospect, I understand why Ferrari tried to cover Albon. I think they should have done it with Vettel and not Leclerc. That's easy to say now. Leclerc's got to wonder. He's got to just start wondering. I don't think it's personal, though, because they're shooting themselves in the foot, and he just happens to be the one who's— I don't think it's obvious that they're messing up Leclerc's strategy and not Vettel's. I think they're just getting strategy wrong in general. Now, they've gotten it right a few times this year, but by and large, you roll that dice— and it's going to come up Mercedes. If they if they have an equal car in a straight fight with Mercedes, Mercedes is beating them four out of five times on strategy alone. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say this. I feel like, and I wish we'd have started the season this way, but I really feel like at most racetracks, we're to a point to where it could be anybody's race where before it was all Lewis's, and I know Lewis won this one, but he did it in an unconventional style. The Ferraris were fast. Verstappen broke the Trek record, even though it got thrown out. I mean, all three big makes were right there. They all had cars that, had they got the strategy right, would have had a chance to seal the victory, and we haven't been able to say that in a while. This is fun. Oh, it's outstanding. I thought that race... I, I had no idea how that race was going to end. I had no idea. And and I could argue 
for Charles Leclerc, if he doesn't have the huge lockup when he's chasing down Botas and Vettel there late in the race with like, I don't know, was it about 15 to go, 12 to go? He was right on their heels and locked up in that just before the turn 10, 11 DRS zone going into that one little turn. He locked it up and went really wide and lost his whole gap. I don't know that he doesn't finish second and put a lot of pressure on. I mean, he was flying well, at the end. What about that pit stop? Oh, it was horrible. He got screwed on that, that pit stop. That was a, what, his four or five ra- second yeah. pit stop? Uh, through no fault of his own, there were two major mistakes. He's right there without those. Yeah. Now, yeah. that's part of racing, but still, mm-hmm. the pace was there in that 16 car to have a shot to win that race. For the third straight week, and for the third straight week, it's a silver car on the top step of the podium, despite not having the fastest car. They've got the best strategy. The pedigree in that team after winning six straight double world championships is unmatched. It is. I know you call Toto Wolf look, lucky. I think he's lucky and good. Well, I think he's. I think that whole team is lucky because they prepare correctly. And how deep are they to do it oh, without it's, Bonington? It's ridiculous. Bonington's home with a medical issue, so the enti- everybody basically takes one step to their left. You know, kind of like if the the groom takes off at a wedding party. You know, the best man just moves over and everyone just takes one step to the side. Is that, is that how that works? Yeah, that, that's why they're all dressed alike, right? <laughs> it's interchangeable. Uh, that's basically what Mercedes did and didn't miss a beat. By the way, what would you think of that podium with the car rising up with Lewis on oh, it? it? I thought that badass. was the coolest thing I'd ever uh, seen. With the, the smoke machines that and Lewis there striking They need to just keep that everywhere. That is so cool. That was badass. It, it, was, it was like a Michael Jackson video with an F1 car in it. I loved it. It was so cool. Now, the, the, you can tell that Mexico puts a lot of effort into their podium celebrations. They've always tried to be different. Yep. Uh, credit to where tracks try to, to get outside of the, the standard procedure because, you know, you do 21 of these a year. It can tend to feel a bit repetitive, especially with the same guy winning over and over again. Uh, they've moved that podium celebration out to the baseball diamond to be in front of more fans. I always thought that was cool, but they took it up a notch. That was a winner. Not every part of this podium celebration was a winner. I want to ask you what you thought about that weird mariachi stig <laughs> with the selfie stick. Vettel didn't care for it. Oh, he, he shoot him out three or four times. Yeah, he he was. Yeah, when they went in for the picture with Botas, uh, Hamilton, and the Mercedes engineer who was up there, he shoved him out oh, of yeah. the photo. It was awesome. Like, Get out of here, dude! And then he called the trophy shitty. Did you see that? They were underwhelming. Well, they looked okay. It to looked me like on the TV. more you know star. So uh, there's a reason for that. I I actually <laughs> looked this up because I was like, <laughs> of course you did. Well, as I, one does. I've seen some shitty trophies in my day, <laughs> and I wanted to see if that'll. They didn't strike me at the time. They they weren't memorable to me, so I had to go look at some pictures once Vettel said that they were shitty. And I'm like, you know, from a distance they look fine. It looks star shaped with like a hue of green on it. Apparently. When you get close to it, it's just a a shiny Heineken commercial passing ah. off as a trophy. It's a star to look like the red star on the bottle. Got it. And he says there's little Heineken words, like, stamped into it all the way up the length of it. I'm like, that is tacky ah, as hell. Money talks. Yeah, but that's not where you want to spend your money, you know? Yeah. I, I'm thankful for anyone who spends and invests in the sport that I love. But that is not a tasteful way of doing it. Did did you feel like the coverage was a? And I know it wasn't because Sky Sports does the same coverage at every race. But the coverage felt different to me being on ABC. I felt like we got a little bit of a different pre race. I felt like we got more of the post race than we normally do. I actually didn't get to see pre race. I you almost always watch the grid walk. Uh, but I was working in Martinsville. I got home at like 10 p.m. And I knew if I watched the grid walk, I was going to be trashed by the time the race was yeah, over. The so grid I, just, walks I just always, skipped ahead, too. Yeah, the grid walk's a little bit hokey, but the, the entire pre-race was good. They had Karun Shanduk got to drive the Mercedes, the actual car. I heard that was coming. I didn't realize that was this week. And uh, it, he I heard said it say, was so incredibly balanced, it was ridiculous. He says it's the best race car he's ever oh, driven. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah, he says it's I, insane. I really like Cowboy Karun. Remember I do, too. we called him that? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I guess his mother's American. And he was driving an F1 in 2011 when they announced the United States Grand Prix was going to happen in 2012, the inaugural race at Coda. And he said, oh, I'm, I, I have a connection to this. The fans should root for me because my mother's American. And, like, everyone was like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it was Buxton took to calling him Cowboy Caroon. I love it. I love it. We'll we'll give you our picks and we'll preview Coda here after the break. But before we go to break, let's review the picks that we had at Mexico 
Eric, if you'll recall, I picked Lewis Hamilton to win the race. But not the championship. And Sergi- and not the championship, so I'm two for two. How about and that? Sergio Perez. Who was I, best of the rest. I took Checo as best of the rest, and he just held off your boy, Danny Ricardo, who you had as best of the rest. Yeah, they, ha- they had a big adventure for that. It was uh, incredible. Yeah, I loved watching it. He doesn't need no break-by-wire programming. I rarely get to beat you at this. You usually hand me my lunch, but I went three for three in that one. I was pretty happy. And I felt good about uh, – I, I had said that if it rains, it would be Max. If it doesn't rain, probably Leclerc. I think both of those drivers had a chance to win that race. I don't know I that Max earlier. couldn't have won it if it had stayed dry if he had kept the tires on yeah, it. Yeah, I think if – or if he doesn't do what he did in qualifying. Yeah. If he, if he lifts off, it's a completely different race. He's not back there fighting with Botas for seventh and eighth on the you know opening lap of the race. If he's starting on pole position, he it, might just cruise that race. Anything else from Mexico we may have missed or I missed? I'm sure there is, but we got so much to talk about. Let's just keep trucking. We do. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll preview Coda and we'll find out what else is going on in racing. I know there's a lot of news in IndyCar. May not be popular with a lot of people. We'll talk about that right after the break. Welcome back to American Racing Snobs. Eric Morse alongside Tony Rizzuti. And, Tony, we were talking about the Mexican Grand Prix. Before we shift gears to preview of the United States Grand Prix at the Circuit of the Americas, where I understand you will be in attendance. Can't is, wait. Is this your first Grand Prix? It will be. Yeah, pop your, your F1 chair. I am. I can't wait. This is, I, I'm so I'm going to be that you. guy when they, if TV doesn't find me in the S's, I'm in turn four. I'm in Section 9. If they don't see me waving my big Ferrari flag, I'm going to be really disappointed because I'm going to literally go, quote, unquote, ape shit every time a red car comes by. You're going to be uh, mistaken for pure Italian tafosi. I am going on Sunday. I'm going to wear red Ferrari polo, which I'm going to buy a crew shirt that I'm going to buy when I get there. And God knows what that's going to cost me. Red pants and red shoes. I'm going in full blown crew mode. It's going to be that guy. Yep. And the weather. The weather. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Friday, 60 degrees, low of 40. Saturday, partly sunny, 63 degrees with a low of 51. And Sunday, 65 degrees, partly sunny with a low of 53. That's almost How perfect nice is that weather. gonna be? That's perfect. Ah. <sighs> hey, you're gonna have a blast. I can't wait. Uh one thing I did want to bring up. You mentioned Lewis Hamilton, 83rd career win. Mm -hmm. You were calling him the GOAT earlier. I think he is. I think he's in the conversation. I teased this last week. I just want to tease it one more time. We've got, you know, busy week this week and probably next week. But in a couple weeks, I want to go through who we think are the greatest Grand Prix drivers of all time from the start of the sport, 1950, all the way up to present year. I've got a pretty good idea what I think the pecking order should be, but I want to hear what you guys think. So please leave us a note on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, however else you can get in touch with us. Leave comments. Tell us what you think, and we'll incorporate that into discussion. I think we'll probably do that not next week because we've got so much USGP to talk, but maybe in that off week before we head to Brazil. Yeah, and you'll want to follow us on social media, at Racing Snobs on Twitter. I'll be posting a ton of videos and different things from the racetrack, and let's be very specific in this ranking, because you and I talked about this, did it need to be specific? And I think we agreed. Yeah. Formula One only. Formula One only, because a lot of great drivers, whether it was Mario Andretti, whether it was Jimmy Clark, whether it was Pick a Person, were very successful in other forms of motorsports besides Formula One. But we are going to keep this to Formula One. That doesn't mean you don't include them. Mm-hmm. But, but, but we're looking but, but at their we want body you of work think, in a Grand Prix only. Correct. So while Mario Andretti, easily one of the greatest racers who ever lived, he had, what, 12 Grand Prix victories somewhere in that neighborhood, one world championship. Uh, another guy who who makes almost everybody's greatest lists uh, for just motorsports in general will be Jackie Ix. But that's a lot of his work at Le Mans, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, as opposed to his Grand Prix career. So, yeah, we'll... We'll uh, hone in on that in just a couple weeks. want to put that out there. You can give it some time to think, and please hit us up so we can incorporate your thoughts into the conversation. All right, let's talk a little bit of the United States Grand Prix as we head to Circuit of the Americas, a racetrack, Eric, that that I really like. I know to the Formula One purists, even though it's a tilty course, 
uh, a lot of people didn't like it at first. It's got some of the famous corners or replicas of famous corners from other racetracks. What's your overall view? Do you like this race circuit? It's it's a fun track. I like it reminds me almost of Silverstone, not just because it has that that Beckett's Maggots complex is copied right before the copy of the Suzuka S's. But what I like is there's a long straightaway in the middle of the lap, kind of like at at Silverstone, you've got the yeah. National Straight and the Hangar Straight. And then uh, coming out of those corners, there's there's a couple of places where you really got to jump on the brakes. And then you got some good medium speed corners. You got elevation change. We've seen that you can pass. It's a real interesting first corner as far as hairpins go. Uh, you it know, feels I, a little bit like Brazil to me. I, obviously, the hairpin's a lot sharper than it is when you get down to San Paulo. Not San Paulo. Yeah. No. Uh, Interlagos. Interlagos. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I never really... You know, you go up the hill, you make the left, then there's the quick right. Kind of has yeah, a that feel bit, to a me a bit. little bit. It's like a truncated version yeah. in Brazil. But I, I do like that run up to turn one. I like that you can stack them two, three wide. There's room to pass. Uh, you can't just automatically shut someone down by protecting the bottom of the racetrack because then it kills your exit going down the hill. You can easily over-under somebody. But the only thing I don't really like about the design is I wish that there was more of a run before the S's started, so that you could kind of sort out who's on the attack from turn one before you have to get single file for those S's. Because there's no two ways about it. You have got to be in line for those S's, the sweeping down the and hill. And they typically aren't on lap one. That was the one thing my wife said. She's like, are we going to really see any action here? And I'm like, on lap one. You'll see somebody miss the On corner. lap one, they're just going to scatter right through there. But then after that, it's going to be nothing but or what was the noise they made last year when they were there? The one guy up oh, in the... the meow, <laughs> meow, meow. Oh, that guy's a legend. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be a good Grand Prix, and I am so jealous that you're going because you're going to see history in the yeah. making. Uh, by the way, if you're not aware of the mathematical situations, if Botas does not win the United States Grand Prix, it is over. If Hamilton is eighth or better... It is over, no matter what Botas does. Tony, I think you got a 95% shot of seeing a world champion crowned, and this is historic stuff, That's breaking the cool. tie with Juan Manuel Fangio at five, getting into rarefied air as only the second driver to hoist six world championship trophies. This is, this is mega, and this is one of his best tracks, too. He's won five of the seven races ever held at Coda. Uh, one of the few exceptions being last year when it was Kimi Raikkonen. In fact, I think Kimi Raikkonen and Sebastian Vell are the only two other drivers to have won there. You have to go back to, I think it was 2013, the year that Vettel ended the season with nine straight wins. Uh, kind of interrupted the uh, Lewis's streak there. And then Kimi getting what is likely the final Grand Prix victory of his career last year. Other than that, it has been utterly dominated by Lewis Hamilton. Do you see any reason for that to change this weekend? I don't know. I don't. I feel like maybe the Ferrari has gotten there, and those long straights are going to help them. They just seem better since they since Singapore. They seem to be the faster car. They just seem to always get the strategy wrong. But I can tell you this: even as a diehard Ferrari guy who cannot stand Mercedes, I have chills just thinking about the fact that I might see Lewis Hamilton win a six championship because I have incredible respect for the man. Like I said, I call him the goat to see that when you mention that just gives me chills. Those are, those are, those are moments you remember for forever. And to think I'm going to break my 10 year old who's been to maybe three NASCAR races and one drag race and a sprint car race. And he's going to see history. That's super cool, man. It's going to be I'm, I'm really excited cool. For you. I'm I am so excited for you. You you never forget your first one. You know who won the first race I went to? Uh, I always go with Schumacher. He's always my guest because he won everything. No, I didn't get to my first race until he was in his uh, first retirement. Danny Rick. Nope. It was Robert Kubica. Oh no, that's a, you've told me yeah, that. That's why you lost you're, my mind. That's why you're. A I was so fan. excited. I was there to write a story for ESPN about BMW and Robert Kubica specifically, and they accidentally finished one two it took a a, a nelson pk jr safety car who was the two who was the other one uh nick heitfeld oh okay yeah um it took a safety car where uh pk brought out the yellow 
And on the pit stops, the lollipop man at the end of pit lane, the pit they, the field hadn't come by the pit exit, so they had to stop the leaders. Hamilton got beat by, uh, I think it was Kimi Raikkonen in the Ferrari, and Lewis didn't realize they were stopping at the end of pit lane and just creamed the back of Kimi Raikkonen right in front of me. Uh, the BMWs came out 1-2. Uh, Kubica on a two stopper had to open up a gap on Heidfeld. And I remember that was the day I totally got F1 because we're stopwatch chasing, trying to see if, if Kubica has enough pace to open the gap on his teammate to pit and still come out in front and then easily walk that race. Cause back then we didn't have DRS. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of overtaking. So we knew that race was going to be decided on the gap and could Kubica get the gap on Heidfeld. I was so excited, but uh, as you are likely to see this weekend, I've been to four Grand Prix, and I have never seen Lewis Hamilton win. Uh, I saw him crash out from pole position there. Uh, I saw him get wrecked by his teammate on a straightaway in the rain at Montreal in 2011. Uh, he was on the podium when I went to Germany in 2012, but that was Fernando Alonso getting the win in the Ferrari. And then a couple of years ago, I saw Botas's amazing start at the uh, Austrian Grand Prix in 2017. That was a race where I was so frustrated because I, I got to Europe only to find out that Lewis had taken a grid penalty for engine components. And I was like, ah, I'm screwed. I don't even have a chance. So I hope you get a chance. In fact, if we're making our picks, I hope for your sake you get to see car number five, Sebastian Vettel, winning the U.S. Grand Prix with Lewis Hamilton celebrating a title. Is that who you really think is going to win, though? I think that Lewis, God, he's such a bulldog. But I think Ferrari is bound to get it right eventually on this strategy. You show up enough times with the fastest car, you're going to get it right eventually. And I think this is that weekend. I, I tend to agree with you. I th- I think it would be too much to ask for great moments at your very first Grand Prix to see Lewis Hamilton win a championship and your favorite driver, Sebastian Vettel, win. So I'm going to go with Charles Leclerc. They're (laughs) finally going to get it right. He's been the fastest of the Ferraris, let's be honest. He's just gotten screwed every time. Or he screwed himself. Uh, He certainly wadded it up in Baku a while back, uh, ending his chances. And like I said, I felt like he could have probably gotten to second and maybe challenged Hamilton if he hadn't had the massive lockup late in the race. So I'm going to go with Charles Leclerc to get the win. Uh, For midfield MVP, man. I don't know because I don't know where Renault's at. And I want to talk about that break bias thing a little bit more because we learned kind of how Racing Point found out about it. I want to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> I just don't know if I'm sold on them yet. I mean, it's obvious easily to go with McLaren. I went with my heart on Checo last week. Bye, yay, yay. Let's go. Do it. Pick a Haas. I dare you. Oh, heck I no. I dare you. No, they've already given up. They've admitted <laughs> they're working on next week. Tony Stewart in that Stewart Haas NASCAR car might have a better chance than, <laughs> than one of the Haas F1 cars. I, I'll just go Lando. Since, it was, since we're saying everything's finally going to come around for people who have had it rough, Lando Norris will be my midfield MVP. I was just looking through the results last year thinking, man, I think Carlos Sainz had a pretty nice drive there, and he did. He finished in the points in the Renault last year. And I was thinking McLaren's due to bounce back. I think that was a bogey performance that we saw. So you and I are both taking uh, extremely cowardly picks. By both taking McLaren's, I will go with signs if you got young Lando. Should be a lot of fun. Like I said, the weather's going to be perfect, so we won't have to worry about overheating. We won't have to worry about trying to cool the engine. It'll be cool. The problem's going to be getting those tires worked in. And again, anytime we're talking about getting tires into the window, advantage Mercedes. They've been the best at it. We've talked for a couple of weeks now, and we're getting ready to wrap up the podcast, but I, I want to get your take on this, and I know you know what I'm talking about. We we wondered this this adjustable computer set per corner brake bias that Renault has had, that they got disqualified from the Japanese Grand Prix for it, but no further action behind that. They're not going to appeal it. They don't think that it was a proper penalty, but they're not going to appeal it. I think that's their way of saying it could have been a lot worse. We're going to take our lumps and move home. But we wondered how Racing Point, of all the teams, they don't run Renault engines, how in the world would they know this has happened? Well, it turns out that at testing in Barcelona, Danny Ricardo went out on an install lap 
with the visor cam, a camera that fits into the visor of the helmet that does the best we can do in current technology to give you the view that the driver does. And in watching the video, somebody noticed something. They noticed that the brake bias number in the upper left-hand corner of the steering wheel kept changing, but the driver's hands had not made any movement on the wheel to make that change. They didn't catch it at first. It was like the third time they watched the video just for fun that they noticed it. Then they noticed it again a couple of weeks later. Somebody went out and they saw in the in-car camera that every car has to have they noticed that it didn't move. And that's when they said to themselves, self, that's a pretty good idea. Could we do that? So they got with their engineers and said, is this something we can build? And the engineers said, yeah, I think we can build that. Are we allowed to? Well, let's ask the FIA. Dear FIA, we think we've come up with a system that will allow the car to change the brake bias preset per corner. The driver could still adjust it, but we want to set it up per corner. Is that allowed? No. Aha. Uh-huh. And they waited and they waited and then they went boom. Waited a until YouTube it would video. Yeah. A YouTube video just to promote the car for the fans' use for social media excitement got Renault in trouble and damn near could have gotten them kicked out of Formula One. I don't think it was that close. I was I nervous. Don't I was nervous about the ramifications and how severe they considered this because I didn't know just how technical what they were doing was. The good thing for Renault was they considered it to be a driver aid. Driver aids are prohibited. Yep. Take your driver aid off, and we are all good. So that's the best case scenario I think for Renault because it was obvious what was happening once you saw that video. Um, I'm not surprised that the FIA took this stance, and I'm glad that Renault's like, well, we'll take our medicine on this. We're not going to appeal. I think we got off lucky because it doesn't affect any other races because they've, they've been using it all season if that video came from preseason testing. Roman Grosjean said that that system, an early version of that system, was on his car when he drove for them in 2015. Yeah. So it could have been a whole lot worse. something they've been working on. And again, Renault doesn't think that video is what gave it away. There is a Renault employee that left Renault that does work for Racing Point, and they believe that person ratted them out. Either way, they got caught. Well, it's a gray area. It's not, And I just think it's fun that it came in a damn social media YouTube yeah. video. That's nuts. Uh, truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. Absolutely it is. Hey, we've had a whole lot of fun talking Formula One, but Eric, I know there's a little bit of other news out there in some of the other motorsports. Uh, indeed. I woke up this morning to a headline I wasn't expecting. Uh, mm. McLaren and their IndyCar program, we've been waiting for them to announce who would be partnering James Hinchcliffe, uh, I believe last week I suggested that Patricio Award would be the front runner. Yep. Nothing has been announced, but it looks like they're set to put Patricio Award and 2019 Indy Lights champion Oliver Askew in that car. They had said that they would honor the contract of James Hinchcliffe, but that does not appear to be the case. It is damn near November, and if they do decide to make this move, they have really left James in a lurch. Because Marcus Erickson, they told him during the season that he wouldn't be coming back. He's had time to find another ride at Ganassi. There's not a whole lot available. So if they do decide to make this move, remember, Ali Askew comes with, uh, what is it, a $1 million scholarship where he's guaranteed uh, a ride for the Indy 500 plus two other races as part of the Mazda Road to Indy for the Indy Lights champion has promised that. Uh, that's that's some incentive right there because it brings some money. And obviously, Ollie's, Ollie's a talented kid. Uh, this ladder system works wonders. I think it's one of the best ladder systems in any motorsport is what IndyCar has, bringing the drivers up through the ranks on the Mazda road to Indy. But what do you make of this? We we don't know for sure what's going to happen, but well, it sure doesn't sound good if you like James Hinchcliffe. If, He's one of the fan favorites. He could be left without a ride. If Marshall Pruitt is riding it, whether you like Marshall or whether you don't, you got to respect the fact that he has well-placed sources within the sport and he won't write something off conjecture. So it's probably as good as a done deal um, that that's happening. And yeah, Hinchcliffe has been, for somebody who has not won a championship, he's really kind of been the forward-facing fan face of the sport. 
Uh, thanks to Honda. Honda puts a lot of money in their commercials. They use him in a lot. Hinchcliffe is that guy. Whenever you need to get a big media hit where you need that fun, happy person. I think he did Dancing with the Stars uh, after uh, Elio had done it. So he's a guy that's been out there. He's been your kind of turn to feel good story guy to not have him in the sport just doesn't seem right. Now, let's talk about options, assuming this is going down the way Mr. Pruitt is speculating right now. Is that who where you saw it originally? Uh, yeah, I saw it yeah. on Racer yeah. um, this morning, and I was like— Marshall doesn't uh, usually get it wrong. Yeah. He's, he's pretty good about waiting to write it when he knows we're just about there. So when the McLaren takeover bombshell dropped, we all expected that James would be out because of his connections to Honda before they said that they would honor his contract. Yeah, because that's, in clarity, we wanted to ask about that when we had the chance to interview Hinch, and that was a no-no. Yeah, we, we were given and, a and couple, we, we a couple topics, that. And, and I totally understand that you don't want to put somebody in a lurch on an entertainment show. you Because know, I don't think he knew. Here, we're he not would... here to break news. No. We're here to, you know, I'd, I'd love to have a scoop for you, but that's not really the nature of a no, weekly We're an podcast. opinion show. Yeah. Uh, we're we're an inter- we're a circus. We like to so stir we're the, entertainment. We like to stir it with a shit stick every now and then. So, the speculation at that time had been that he would be a contender for a third car at Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan, one of the top Honda teams. Uh, they've since walked that back and said they would not be able to expand to a third team this year. The only other thing I can think of that really adds up is we know that Ganassi just expanded to a third car to include Marcus Erickson. Chip really wants to keep his guys employed. And remember, he has two Ford GT programs that are based in this country that aren't going to be racing next year. No, he but a lot of those guys are going to Wayne Taylor Racing or a couple well, of them. The will. drivers. I'm talking about the crew. I got The you. truck drivers, the mechanics, the engineers. Those are full-time employees, and Chip really wants to keep those guys. It's a good group. So he's been trying to get a fourth car funded. And I believe he was in talks with Oliver Askew recently. If Ollie's off the market and James is on the market, he's one of the most marketable guys out there. You got to believe that's his best chance to find the money to run that car. If James if James Hinchcliffe just found himself out of a ride and into a Chip Ganassi ride, he did better. <laughs> no offense, but that car he was in was not really all that competitive. It's a good it was car. Okay. It's, it's, it's a race winning car. It I wasn't don't a Chip think it's a Ganassi car. Though. It's not a Chip Ganassi car. Chip Ganassi, there's Roger Penske cars, there's Chip Ganassi cars, and there's Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, Andretti, all those cars. There's not a car out there that can't fight for race wins, except for maybe the A.J. Foyt squad. Uh, Carlin looked like they were behind it. But if, if Steinbrenner can put a car out there with Harding and win races with Colton Herta, if you can see Dale Coyne, continually putting Santino Ferrucci They're and still not Chip Boyd, Ganassi racing. But they can get up there and fight for wins. If you've got one of the, basically, you can fight for a race victory or at least a podium in almost any car in that series. There's only a couple cars that can win championships. Ganassi might be one of them. Now, we've seen Ganassi kind of spread themselves pretty thin before. The last time they ran four cars was a couple years ago, back when they still had Charlie Kimball in the mix. Uh, I think Graham Rahal was over there for a couple seasons. Uh, I don't know if that would be asking a lot to go from two teams to four teams. And this is all speculation yeah. on our behalf. But if you're a James Hinchcliffe fan, I think that's the best you can hope for. There's no real seats available at the NASCAR level. But could he be a guy that could make the conversion over to full-bodied stock cars? Keep in mind, one of the biggest areas, fan base areas for NASCAR outside of really the South is Canada. I There's a bunch of fans that love stock car racing up in Canada. I think he'd be a great person to bring to NASCAR. Whether he was successful or not, hard to say. Really, only Juan Pablo Montoya had any Tony Stewart. S- significance. Well, yeah, that's true. You know, well, definitely with Smoke. You're right. I don't know that Smoke was in IndyCar long enough to he was really— a champion. I know he was a champion, but how long had he been there— Two, Two three years. years. Yeah, he won the second season. I mean, he of hadn't the fully racing. gotten seasoned in to where he and didn't know anything different. It was a weird time different. in in open wheel racing. It was IRL and yeah, he had the the big split in yeah. the nineties and Tony kind of benefited. But you're right. From, yeah, Tony's Tony's obviously yeah. the top of that list. Yeah, but. To- in recent years, and then uh, you know other guys who tried it and didn't have as much success would be you know someone like Scott Pruitt, 
Danica Patrick, Dario Franchitti. It was all the rage. We were we were taking all the open wheel yeah. drivers in the the mid two thousands when NASCAR was. Well, and it was a smart money. move for them too yeah. because it was a lot of money. It was yeah. way more money than any car. Uh, I I know for a fact that James has been wanting to try NASCAR. I mean, but Honda's I don't always think been rumored as a potential 2021, 2024 well, that would make a, entry. But yeah, but that's a too, long way off. Is too far out, yeah. but twenty one's not to get him in something I don't small. See and, him as a full time guy. I think I, I would not be surprised to show him pop up at an Xfinity or a truck road course race and see, just I try hate, to have some fun. I hate just sticking these guys on the road course. It's where so their like skill ra- set. I lies. get it, but if you're a racer, let's let them race. Uh, but do you know? It's such a learned skill. There's nothing like driving a stock car on an oval, and without years of coming up the ladder system, I don't it's know. a very rare talent. Kurt to- Busch did pretty good in the Indy car when he went to the Indy 500. He had no experience. He is a rare talent, and I'm not saying James Hinchcliffe isn't. I'm just saying you don't see guys come in and have success racing an oval program. Yeah. Uh, remember how good Sam Hornish was? Yeah. On the road courses. And he wasn't a good road course racer in open wheel. In fact, he one of the main reasons he left IndyCar was that they were doing more and more road races. He was more of an oval guy. He came to NASCAR, and he, he had a, a very interesting career if you kind of break down his progress versus the economics of where the rides went right as he was starting to figure it out. But there's no denying that Sam Hornish's best drives in NASCAR were on a road course, yeah. even though he's not considered a road course specialist in IndyCar. And same thing with Danica. She had some really good races in NASCAR on the road courses as well. Uh, that's neither here nor there. There's I hope Hitch finds something. Uh, absolutely. And and we still don't know for a fact that he's out, but mm. it's the writing mm. does appear to be on the wall. Mm. Uh, another driver that you uh wondering where they're going to end up full-time. Ooh. Fernando Alonso is in the news. Dakar. It is on, Tony. <laughs> the defending champion, Toyota Gazoo Racing. That's the same team that Fernando has two Le Mans victories with. They are going to field four trucks, including last year's winner, three-time Dakar champion, Nasser al Uh Riding along with Fernando, by the way, in the Toyota Hilux will be the extremely experienced Spanish navigator, Mark Coma, who himself is a five-time winner of this event. And by the way, that race will be taking place in January in Saudi Arabia for the first time ever. Uh, quick history lesson on Dakar. Yes. Uh, I know uh, some of you may be confused geographically going, I thought Dakar was in Africa. It is. It's the capital of Senegal. Uh, The very first race was held in 1979. It was the Paris to Dakar rally. uh, And the race continued on more or less that route, sometimes starting in Portugal, uh, crossing over at Gibraltar and down through Mauritania into Senegal. Uh, In 2008, the event had to be canceled due to security concerns in Mauritania. And starting in 2009, The event had a 10-year run running in South America, although the organizers chose to keep its now confusing geographical name, the Dakar Rally. Uh, By the way, Fernando Alonso, not the first F1 driver to try this. You want to venture a guess? Oh, man, don't do that to me. (laughs) I know. I'm putting you on the spot here. Uh, I said his name earlier as a driver who had a great overall racing career, but maybe not considered an F1 great. Jackie X. Indeed. Mr. Lamont himself won the Dakar Rally in 1983. Uh, by the way, if Fernando decides to defend his Rolex 24 crown at Daytona, that will make a very busy January for him. It's not a conflict, uh, but Dakar is scheduled to end the week leading up to the Rolex 24, so we'll keep an eye on him. Right now, the only Wayne Taylor racing driver confirmed for that seat as they try to defend their crown is Kamui Kobayashi. By the way, should I be concerned? I just got a uh, a nice email here from Coda saying, we're excited to have you at the Grand Prix. Please download our app and everything, and they're showing their parking map. I bought an aftermarket parking pass. Oh, yeah? Through Vivid Seats because they were sold out to Lot Z. Is that on They know Z on my map. (laughs) Should I be concerned? I would be. I don't know about that. They're going to try to sell you some Tiger repellent, too. I mean, I've always had good luck with that. That's a, There's like a 100% buyback guarantee if it's bad, but that didn't help me with parking. It doesn't give you a I've place been Lot to... Z. I might have to call. I yeah, wonder if I... Lot Z is somebody's yard. <laughs> it's Zed's yard. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, what other thing to catch you up on? Actually, two other things. It's been a busy weekend. Yeah. Uh, supercars. Gold Coast 600, Surfer's Paradise. You're familiar with that it's track. It's a great racetrack. You used yeah. to run IndyCar back there they way did. back in the day. That, Kart? That, that's where uh, John Andretti's lone IndyCar victory came. Hi, uh, John. Back in the early 90s. Uh, 
they had a double header. Uh, and we also had the co-drivers were back sharing the seats with the Supercars regulars this weekend. And on Saturday, it was Jamie Wincup and Craig Lowndes taking the victory ahead of Shane Van Ginsbergen and Garth Tander. That's a triple eight one two for those of you keeping track at home. Which, Did you see the big wreck? Oh, I'm getting to that. Okay, sorry, sorry. Scotty McLaughlin Woo! finished in third with Alex Prema, our Bathurst winner. However, the big story of the weekend was what happened to Scotty McLaughlin in qualifying for race number two. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with um, Chaz Mostert. Another supercar driver. He had a mega crash. Rolls right off my tongue. Yeah. Chaz uh, fractured his femur a couple of years ago in a very similar crash to what I'm about to describe, uh, where basically in qualifying, McLaughlin's going into a left-hander, and he just kissed the inside wall, got a little too much of the curb, and, and tried to almost shortcut the apex, kissed the barrier, and it spit him out as... They were coming to another left-hander right into the outside retaining wall. It was a lurid crash, completely sideswiped uh, on the passenger side, luckily. And the car got – it ripped the axle off. The car slid down on its side. Uh, Scott was able to climb out under his own power, but the impact was 43 Gs. Ooh, wow. And the car that won Bathurst is totaled. So, Scott – was hospitalized for observations. He ended up missing the race on Sunday. He also had a, uh, a mechanical failure earlier this year uh, on the formation lap, so it now shows two races that he has not started this year, but he still has a 463-point lead with only three races remaining, and he has been cleared to drive. So it looks like Scott McLaughlin dodged a huge bullet because this could have been ugly if he had uh, had a season-ending injury. That could really put a tarnish on what could have been or will likely still be back-to-back championships for the Team Penske DGR driver. By the way, in race number two, it was another triple eight one two finish with SVG and Garth Tander reversing the order from Saturday. But glad Scotty's okay. Uh, 43 Gs, that's, uh, that's a mega impact. That's crazy. You don't see that kind of thing in stock cars Mm-mm. very often. Mm-mm. Uh, so luckily, he's all right. We have three races remaining, the Sandown 500 coming up on November 10th, and a doubleheader at Newcastle on November 23rd, 24th. Uh, one last race I want to talk to you about. All right. Japanese Super Formula Championship, because why not? I love it. They were at Suzuka for their finale, and Naoki Yamamoto, remember him? No. He was the uh, charming young man who drove the Toro Rosso. Yeah, well, yeah. At ja- yeah, Japan. Sorry. Yeah, he came in as the favorite as the defending champion of the Super Formula Series and the points leader, but he could only manage fifth place in the finale. Meanwhile, it was Alex Palou of Spain who looked like he was going to steal the show. He was putting pressure on everyone else by claiming pole position, but he had an awful race. He went from first to 19th Mm. on the racetrack because apparently an intercooler tube came loose, got tangled up in the rear suspension, and basically rendered the diffuser useless because no airflow was getting to it. They couldn't figure out what was wrong, uh, so he was basically out of it. And that opened the door for Kiwi Nick Cassidy to overhaul both of them and claim the title in big upset fashion. Wow. He is the first foreign-born driver to win the Japanese Super Formula Championship since Andre Lotterer in 2011. Good stuff, man. Empty in the bucket for you, Tony. We've gone 58 minutes, 26 seconds. That's a solid show right there. Right, you won't, If we don't hurry it up, you're going to miss your flight. You're going to get to the airport, get <laughs> hey, to Austin. Hey, one last thing. I was watching Nico Rosberg's podcast from Mexico. Uh, he'll be in Austin. I hope I run into him. Big fan of his. Kind of miss him in Formula One. I like it when he jumps on the, the Sky broadcast. He's, He's still young enough to do it. Oh, yeah. But he was old enough to know he didn't want to go to war with Lewis Hamilton for the rest of his life. It's true. Love to see him back. Uh, Hopefully get to run into all those. As always, follow us on social media, especially this weekend, at Racing Snobs on Twitter. Uh, You're going to be posting all kinds of pictures. Some videos, pictures, pretty much more than you'll want to see. You'll probably give you a scavenger hunt. Something. I want want to see. Yeah, somebody find my Lot Z. Now I'm all paranoid. First of all, find Lot Z. I want to see a Verstappen fan in clogs. I want okay. to see a Verstappen fan in uh, – I, I guess we'll only do one Verstappen fan. I want to see somebody wearing an Alex Rossi F1 shirt. Oh, that'd be strong. Yeah. 
They, they exist. They're hard to find. That'd be strong. I know. I know at least two exist. I have one. My wife has one. Very nice. I I, I showed Alex, and he's like, "Wow, I didn't even get one of those." <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on the lookout for that. As always, our picks for this weekend, I like Charles Leclerc to get the win, and I like Lando Norris to be my midfield MVP. Eric, you were Sebastian Vettel and Carlos Sainz? That is correct. If I correct, so that should be fun. Lock them in. We've been, we've been dead on. It's one of us has gotten it right, so if you're in a pool, go with those. As always, follow us on social media at Racing Snobs. Be sure to download and subscribe to the podcast. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're everywhere you find your racing podcast. For Eric Morse, I'm Tony Rizzuti. See you next time on American Racing Snobs.